morning everyone uh, it is indeed my great pleasure to introduce dr kantimati kulkarni dr kulkarni is a senior scientist at adharkar research institute pune she is an alumnus of ferguson college from where she graduated and the pune university from where she completed her post graduation in geology her journey with trace fossils started with her phd work around 40 years ago and i believe that no one can understand trace fossils as well as she does she has authored innumerable research publications she has participated in national and international conferences and guided many students for their post graduate and phd dissertations i feel very lucky to be one of them not just ecology but she is also well versed with all kinds of fossils she has special interest in mollusca especially bivalves and gastropods also she has a vast field experience of working on fossils of different ages right from proterozoic to quaternaries and she has almost uh, she's worked on almost all sedimentary basins from peninsular india dr kulkarni is a passionate behavioral ecologist who has been successful in tracing evolution of life through trace fossils Kanti Mati ma'am also has done a lot of initiatives for multiple activities for the popularization of paleontology amongst the public and being a true field geologist she has a lot of knowledge and many field stories to tell so with, so without delaying it further i request Kanti Mati ma'am to please take us to the exciting world of trace fossils good morning everyone and uh, thank you amrita and i think you have uh, gone a bit overboard in <laughs> telling the stalwarts about my achievements uh, anyway uh, good morning to everyone uh, mp singh sir shah sir yes i have referred to your papers when i began my phd and uh, especially the extra peninsular region and uh, well it has uh, given me a lot of impetus and uh, let's now get to the uh, topic of today that is uh, ecology and uh, well this was the topic uh, the title rather given to me by rajini and uh, where else can we see uh, the traces being created than the coast and we are blessed with a very long coastline beautiful beaches and estuaries and where you can see uh, traces being created in and live action and uh, let me give you a slight insight into the history of of uh, trace fossils well these objects were uh, identified way back in the 18th century and uh, they were identified as a uh, few coids because the knowledge available then was uh, people correlated them with different types of uh, plant fossils and uh, that's how the journey of uh, trace fossils actually began and for a long period almost till the mid 18th century uh, 19th century we had people reporting trace fossils as uh, fucoids and these are some of the examples which actually are trace fossils and it was only uh, in the uh, early 20th century around 1927 when rudolf richter in germany started studying or observing the coast of uh, the north sea and he had an entire laboratory to himself and that is where he started correlating the traces being created there with those that were fossilized and occurring in different sedimentary rocks and that is why 1927 and rudolf richter are considered as the pioneers of modern day ecology well we have come a long way in ecology rather from just describing structures and correlating with them uh, with the probable creators and uh, today we will see how 
Uh, one thing that I've realized in all these years is that uh, if you want to do paleo ecology, your uh, new ecology has to be good. And your observations of the animal activities and behaviors in different settings are so very important. So now let me take you to some action that is happening along the coast. What we see here is a crab feeding just around its burrow. And the picture that you just saw before this showed you a lot of marks. Those are the marks left behind by the claws of the crabs feeding around themselves, around their domiciles, around their dwellings. What we're now going to see are, are the expressions of the different traces and the impact that the substrate consistency has on their morphology. Here you are seeing crabs rolling up balls and around, arranging them around their burrows. The balls there were very well formed. Here we come to a region where, as you can see, the balls are no doubt being rolled and placed, but they're losing their shape. And all this is just because of the water capacity in this particular substrate. We move on to a slow mover, and here we are seeing a different activity. The train that you see here, as you can very well visualize, is the excrement being left behind by this gastropod. see plenty of trails here and if one were to just go by their morphology we would feel that they have been created by some gastropod uh, some arthropods because you have a median line and then you have uh, grooves on either side and some of the grooves show you some fine markings and the markings are again well preserved only where the substrate is quite coherent Let's again see who has created these traces. Well, as we all can see that this is not an arthropod, but a fish and the fish gills have been, the pins have been modified into somewhat legs. In fact, we need to know what kind of behavior and what kind of assemblages that we get in the present day create certain traces so that we can uh, interpret the trace fossils that we have with us. Here you can see plenty of brittle stars. And as we know that brittle stars occur in uh, moderately shallow waters, and where they occur, they occur in large numbers. And this particular slab shows you the impressions of the arms as well as the oral disc, which gives you a rough idea about the outline of these animals. So, to briefly put it in sort of definitions, let's define ancient activities preserved in rocks, activities of organisms are called trace fossils. And the branch which deals with the study of traces left behind by organisms is called ichnology. If we are studying trace fossils, then that branch is called paleoichnology. And when we are dealing with modern traces, it's called as neoichnology. It's not very different from paleontology and neontology. Now, what is it that sets these two classes of fossils apart? One, of course, as we've seen, is a 
biogenic sedimentary structure. Whereas body fossils actually tell you something about the very animal. Why they tell you about the anatomy of ancient organisms, trace fossils provide us a lot of evidence or insight into their behavior. And it is interpreting this behavior that tells us about the past environment and helps in interpreting the past environments and to the different uses that we can put these trace fossils to right from evolution of life to hydrocarbons what are the main things that one needs to know about trace fossils well these are generalized there are exceptions trace fossils are common in otherwise unfossiliferous rocks and this is where they help in interpreting many things because we do not have fossils here to tell us anything about the environment or the ecology now one important thing is one organism or one individual can produce a variety of structures corresponding to the different behaviors that it is going to perform during its lifetime or in a single day. Here, I would like to draw your attention to a post that uh, Dr. Shudhi, uh, Sudhir Shukla had posted a couple of days ago on uh, human traces on the PSI uh, group. And that's about a woman running with a sloth in chase. And so if that is what we can definitely interpret for the vertebrates, we can do so even for the invertebrates. Now, different animals can produce the same structure if their behavior is the same. And vice versa, one individual with identical behavior but differing substrates can give you different structures as we just saw with the crab. Just touched upon this, that where you have similar behavior, all human beings walking on their two legs are going to produce the same structure irrespective of them being different individuals. Abundance. At certain levels in the stratigraphic column or in certain horizons, we see plenty of traces being preserved. Does that mean that we had so many individuals? No, definitely not. If we observe the present day coast also, you will see a snail creating many traces because surely because it's mobile. Same is the case with the more mobile animals, especially the crabs. No secondary displacement or transport. This is the most valuable feature or facet of the group of fossils that we call as trace fossils. Since they're sedimentary structures, if there is displacement, the structures themselves are going to be destroyed. And even in case of transport, very rarely, like the fills of thalassomides or ophiomorpha, we can have them, but we know they can be easily separated out as that they're being transported. Whereas in the case of body fossils, at times it becomes difficult. If there is not much wear and tear, it becomes difficult to tell them from the orthogenic ones, so the in situ ones, to be slightly transported. This feature also gives another uh, what do you say a parameter and that they the trace fossils take you closest to the environmental setting when you're interpreting with body fossils there is always a time lag between the actual uh, environment in which they lived and where they preserved so this, this is the advantage that you have when you're dealing with trace fossils, not to undermine the value of body fossils. Because finally, we are dealing with 
paleontology. In ethnology, we have what has been coined by the great uh, Professor Richard Bromley as one ethnology, where that is mega, micro, invertebrate, plant produced, or uh, the invertebrates or vertebrates. So it is one ethnology. So we need to propagate the concept of one paleontology also through our forum. As I said, trace fossils are largely species dependent and that a group of trace fossils can tell you so much about a given setting. And the, what do you say, the lack side is that the organism is very, very rarely preserved, especially only in the case of certain borings. Now, what do the trace fossils tell up if we were to sum up? They are the product of three parameters. The producer, its behavior, and the substrate conditions. The variations in all these determine the resultant morphology of the trace fossils. And that's why understanding the morphology and relating it to the behavior is very important. Here, what I would like to stress or emphasize is that, and this is where one needs to know a lot of animal anatomy and morphology. So let me take you back in time and uh, the way, I mean, Dr. Anand Kale yesterday did said, right from the Proterozoic onwards, we should be paying more attention to fossils which he very aptly said, because it's only after a certain period in the history of the earth or in the history of organic evolution do we have skeletonized animals which further go on to be preserved as fossils. But what happened before that? Yes, there were soft-bodied animals and they were leaving behind traces. Now, here you can see vertical burrows. We know of the time period, it's late Proterozoic. We definitely know there were no animals with very well-formed appendages, but yet we do have such traces. How were these traces formed? They were traced, these were formed by pull and push mechanism, which has been explained very well by R.B. Clark way back in 1964. And from this, we can tell a lot about the antiquity of metazoan evolution, because to produce vertical burrows and have this pull and push mechanism, the tissue has to have, the cell has to have a three layer or what we call as triploblastic arrangement of the tissue. Of the cells, and because only when there is a silome can the silomic fluid or the hydrostatic skeleton or the hydrostatic fluid can pull and push and act as anchor and bring about the propagation of the animal. So that's where we start off making use of trace fossils in use uh, for the evolution of life. We then move on. This is a very celebrated drawing, drawn by none other than Adolf Zeilecker. I have taken it from Aigdelitar. And here you have two geologists arguing about where should the Precambrian Cambrian boundary be placed. This gentleman has trilobite trace fossils, trilobite fossils, body fossils, and he says it should be placed here. Whereas this gentleman who understands more about ecology or trace fossils has traces produced by trilobite like arthropods. And that brings down our Precambrian Cambrian boundary. And as of today, it is accepted that where you have the first trilobite or arthropod, trilobite like arthropod traces, along with certain other 
trace fossils. I wouldn't like to name them here and make it a bit cluttery for the students. We have the pre-Cambrian Cambrian boundary lowered. So that's how we use the trace fossils for looking at a time slot when we really do not have body fossils preserved. Let me come to another behavior of animals. Again, a very celebrated trace fossil. And uh, let me first explain to you the diagram out here. You have a U-shaped burrow and this middle side, and where you have the U of the burrow at the end. Adjoining figure, you have the U of the burrow much above some of the menisci. This you do get in the field and you can see them very well. Now, well, this definitely says something very typical of this animal behavior in response to a certain set of given conditions. Here it's going down. It is adjusting its level or protecting itself from being exposed to heat and dryness so it's moving into the sediment that is protrusive whereas as sedimentation progresses it moves upwards to maintain its level with the bedding plane so that it can get food and these are some of the pictures that we have from Kutch. this is the u-shaped burrow and this is how it looks on the bedding plane and now these are known as opportunistic burrows because they are able to adjust to the fluctuating levels of the sediment water interface and also they are very very abundant they are able to adjust where there are salinity fluctuations so now we know where such conditions prevail and then correlate it with these conditions and the fossil status. When I talk to you about sedimentation, and here we have a trace, a structure, which is not very well defined, but yet we have a trail like, this is a vertical face, and then you have chevron shaped structures, cone in cone. Modern day studies have shown that if there is continuous steady sedimentation going on at a fairly good rate, then there are bivalves that live within the substrate at a certain depth that start moving upwards. And these are bival escape structures. So if you have such structures, you can even go to a fairly great extent in predicting or in interpreting the rate of sediment. The next one, of course, is again a behavior of a crab. You have the crab burrow, and then you can see a much narrower tunnel. Why would an animal create such a structure? And this is what we want to, that is what many of the ecologists have found out, that this particular structure is one thing to pre prevent desiccation and secondly it acts as a what do you say a fort it protects the animal inside from predators both these are from the cretaceous of south india well plenty of almonds badam bekhere hue and this is the slab that I'm showing you a close up. They look very much like almonds. And here you can see that along with these almonds, there are some disturbances on the surface. Well, who created them? Such bivalves created. Why? When you get so much this abundance, it obviously says that the conditions were very, very congenial. It was very comfortable for the denizens 
inhabiting that particular region. And then what does it tell us? Let's go to the field. And this is how these resting marks of bivalves look. This is the underside of the bed. And what happened? What history of this particular bed and the bed below that? Presently, we do not see a bed below there. But the details that we can see here tells us a lot of history about this bed. Well, there was deposition taking place and we had fine grained sediments, very fine that were deposited. And there were bivalves living here. And what, how do these bivalves rest? With their foot, they dig a pit and then with the help of their adductor muscles, they draw the shell close to the sediment and rest there. And if there is either some sort of disturbance, maybe sedimentation, they move away from there, living a depression. Fine grained, fairly well compacted. So this depression remains as it is. And with the next, what, what we call as the casting medium, which is slightly coarser, this depression gets filled up. And obviously, since this is the casting medium, the depression, the trace of the depression gets ad adhered or attached or amalgamated to this particle. On uplift and exposure, this fine grained sediment is or layer is removed by erosion. And what we have left is just this sandstone bed. So, this one bed. And a cluster of trace fossils can tell us so much about the depositional history for a very given short period of time in the Earth's cycle. Moving on from the soft ground or uh, the traces that can be left behind in wet sediment, let's go on to the traces that are left behind on consolidated or indurated rocks. What we term as hard grounds. How do we identify hard grounds? Well, we can see here plenty of encrusters. Most of them are bivalves. And these bivalves are sessile bivalves, especially the oysters, that need a hard substrate to attach themselves to, to complete their life cycle. That tells us that yes, it's a hard ground. But one thing is that these oysters can also attach themselves to what are called as stiff grounds or firm grounds. What happens next? We move on and we see here that these shells have pits in them. And along with them, in the adjacent rock also, we do have these pits. Experimentation has shown that such pits are emplaced by or drilled by different types of uh, coronid worms and also certain bivalves. And what you see here are mostly the bival borings, clavid bival borings. You make artificial casts of them. You can uh, detail them on their uh, structure and find out what kind of bivalve produced them. And at times you do have the producer also preserved in the boring and then you can identify them very nicely. Now, where are these hard grounds useful to us? They are the most useful to us in interpreting sedimentation breaks or gaps or hiatuses in sedimentation. And this particular feature is very important in sequence time. Now let you tell me about uh, let me tell you about a single bed. <clears throat> what you see here is a let's go by normal terms, a limestone bed, which is very well indurated. And here this portion is a conglomerate overlain by the quaternaries. This is Jurassic in age. Let's see what do we have here. A close-up of the same bed and 
If you have a close look here, you will see this portion is again bored by many by one borings, overlain by the conglomerate. What does this have for us? This was initially a soft ground, so definitely there would be uh, traces left behind by animals inhabiting such an environment. We have these three typical scan mark traces and a very, uh, what do you say, prominent about for uh, interpreting regions of uh, reduced oxygen and low food availability. The upper portion has really become hard and it is exposed to seawater and that is when you have encrustus as well as borers. See the encrustus and the borers here. That means this has been totally turned into a rock. It is a hard ground and this indicates a break in sedimentation. Overlying this, you have the conglomerate and the conglomerate pebbles include the pebbles of the bold horizon or of the hard ground. Now that is sufficient evidence to tell you about the gap in ex uh, deposition, ex exposure, erosion and redeposition. So all the we can see, we can interpret with the help of trace fixes. We saw about the animals drilling into hard substrates. Now there are certain animals that also bore into shells. These are mobile hard substrates. What do they have for us? Well, you again have here a variety of borings, as you can see. These are the typical clavet shaped borings by the bivalves. But here, all these are sponge borings. Now, all those, by, even by common sense, we know that sponges occur where there is very less sedimentation because it's known it's a known fact that if there is even slight turbidity then these sponges get smothered off so when you have so much you can talk about the turbidity of the waters and if they are available to you as a uh, cast as as natural cast then you can also tell about the water chemistry usually they occur as they uh, they are available to us as pits in shells and then you have to cast them dissolve the shell and then find out but when you have them in nature they tell you about changes in water chemistry because if you have aragonitic shells and the sea water chemistry changes to calcitic then these shells are dissolved away and along with them they are cast with the Borings that it so that is how you can interpret the ch changes in water chemistry through time. Another interesting aspect of the boring bivalves, which will it's it's from an uh, example from recent times, but nonetheless very interesting. 175 years ago, the first modern tunnel was built. And this was inspired by a small boring animal. And who was this person, the animal? Let's look into the history of the tunnel. What happened? This tunnel was constructed below the Thames River, known as the Thames Tunnel. It took 18 years and finally it was opened in 1843 to the public. But before it was completed, there was an accident. There was a water leakage and then the tunnel, workers in the tunnel drowned and hence the work had to be stopped. But there were two engineers who were very, very smart and not the kind who would just sit back in their armchairs and relax. So where they were doing the construction, they got inspired by a mollusk, a bivalve, a wood boring bivalve called pteridor. And 
their observations of this particular mollusk revolutionized the tunneling engineering which till today we use this is the burrow the animal and if you can have if you it's visible to you on your screens you will see that there is a sheet where it has bored it prepares or it secretes the sheet behind it and it like a rotary bit it keeps on drilling way ahead and this is the observation that they made and from this observation the idea of casing the tunnels and moving ahead putting the casing behind you dawned on them and that was how the thames tunnel finally was thrown open to public in 18 43 now we use walls and bricks and concrete to line our tunnels in such difficult terrains initially there were people used wood now they are using tunnels so this is also an important contribution of the subject of ecology though at that point of time we didn't know it but yes now we can definitely appreciate this let's see another sign of behavior i'm just introducing you to the different kinds of behaviors and the traces different animals leave behind and how do we interpret them this particular picture is from the modern day coast and as you can see the entire block here is covered by algae the green portion the yellowish green portion is algae but you have a beautiful pattern who made that someone living in the water or in the sed surrounding sediment so this thing unfortunately we could not observe the animal creating this the way we could do the crab and the snail and other things but we had it ready for us you can see a beautiful systematic pattern that means this was either a gastropod or a fish that was eating away or feeding on the algae but was it feeding on the entire substrate no it was picking up what it wanted and which was not available in plenty so it it wanted to expend less energy and get maximum out let's move on to the other three pictures and this is what we see here here we have a mesh like arrangement meant for trapping food some of the foronid uh, worms create circular traps where they trap food or they cultivate algae and where do we find such systematic in the deep sea because in the deep sea availability of oxygen is low whatever is available it has to be used most efficiently food resources in the sediment availability is also low so they have to scan spend minimum energy scan maximum area so that they can thrive there so when you get such features you can go back to the settings and understand so to understand what you have in fossils you have to understand the present day behavior of animals and that is how it, it is ecology and we divide it for our convenience into further branches science is not divided into watertight compartments by nature it is we human beings probably because our brains have a limitation of processing data that we divide it for our or have compartments for our own understanding let's come to a very typical behavior we have nursing homes do we just go to the nursing homes for the heck of it no nursing homes 
are places where our offsprings are born under safe conditions and taken care of and looked after. Where did this idea come from? We have borrowed this idea from nature. So, very often an animal would not take so much of effort to construct a living home. Special features are constructed only when the need is specific. And here we have a plus shaped structure. You have a long neck and a bulbous region. And here you have see some you see something of pads. This was a very stupefying find because we could not imagine what animal would have done this. So we had to consult arthropod zoologists who gave us insights into the behavior of certain group of uh, arthropods which construct such burrows, line it with algae, lay eggs here, seal this top and go away. Once the eggs hatch, they have food for them here. And when they, when they have strength, they broke, break open the upper lid and swim away. And that is how their life cycle goes on. Here, for the benefit of understanding, we have reconstruction of how this would look in three dimensions. So here, with one object, one structure, we have talked about the behavior or the where what do you say parental care of the young and it dates back to the permian times and this we have bought this particular fossil we have retrieved from the badhara beds of Rajasthan. this is how it looks in field and uh, well i do not have the picture here but you should trust me, believe me, that along this particular horizon, we have n number of such structures. Now, what does that indicate? That indicates why would so many individuals be creating such structures at a given point of time, given slice of time in our Earth's history. That tells us we are looking at the snapshot of a breeding season of these particular arthropods. So it is all these minor things or important, though uh, that appear to be minor, these important features and the evolution of life and the depositional histories of different basins that we can interpret with the help of trace fossils. Now, this is something that we cannot comprehend by studying body fossils alone. Body fossils help us in so many other ways. One of the most important things are that they, they are very good stratigraphic in stratigraphic studies. Whereas, since these are species dependent, they are not very good for stratigraphic. Yes, there are ways and means of using them for local stratigraphic purposes, local correlations. Now, the, uh, what do you say, the hot topic. Everyone wants to know that if I do geology, if I do paleontology, can I work in the oil industry? How will my work be useful for hydrocarbon exploration? Will it or will it not? Well, for a long period of time, trace fossils were not used for or were considered useless in hydrocarbon exploration. But thanks to the work, phenomenal work of Pemberton and his school, that now we have very, very strong evidences that yes, bioturbation. I, I may introduce the students to this term. What is bioturbation? Bioturbation is the churning up 
or modification of the initial sedimentary characteristics by animal activity. I'll just explain to you this series of diagrams here. Here we have micritic sediment deposited. And as most of us do understand that this is very poor since because of the fine grain size, porosity is very low. Yeah, but then there was a stand, no deposition taking place, and there was a slight bit of dewatering. And then there were these arthropods that colonized this particular sedimentary horizon. And when they colonized, they built tunnels and they built shafts and they built a boxwood. What happened? The later on sedimentary episode, which was sand, it filled up these open burrows. Then what do we have? In a host which had very low permeability and porosity, we have increased porosity. And because of the connectivity of these burrows, we have bioturbation induced permeability. And this example is a very famous example. I must have quote myself quoted them a number of times and people quoting it all over the world who are dealing with ecology. This is a very highly producing well from the Ghavar oil field in Saudi Arabia. And the uh, statistics given is that 70% of the oil produced from this particular oil field comes from such horizons. And that is the role of the bioturbation or technology in hydrocarbons. We got another example of bioturbation where we have, there we saw a single unit. And here we have interlayered beds, sandstone and siltstone, but the burrowing extends downwards and it connects all the coarse grained layers. You have two examples, one from the Cenozoic, Mesozoic and the other from the Paleozoic. And this is how we can use effectively and efficiently the work of these animals, which they did unknowingly, but are very beneficial to us. And this is the, uh, what do you say, the glorified or the most important use of trace fossils if you were to pr pr put it in hydrocarbon exploration. And with that, I take you again back to the tidal flats of uh, Taurashtra, where we have beautiful stocks leaving behind their traces. And uh, I wish to thank the Paleontological Society of India, and Dr. Shukla, Dr. M.P. Singh, Rajni, and all my colleagues and friends, and Professor Shaha for attending this uh, webinar. Thanks a lot, everyone.